what drew you to this conversation? It's got this um, idea of this, this thought question, what's love got to do it at the heart of this, um, this moment that we're sharing together? What's love got to do with it? Um, and what about rage and grief and despair? Um, really, what I want to share with you all is a little bit of how my work with mindfulness and bringing mindfulness together with um, the challenging work of turning toward uh, the suffering that is in our midst, even as we do the best we can to take care of ourselves, attend to our own needs for wellness, um, maybe in some ways rest on a mindfulness practice to support us in our individual efforts to navigate this very challenging time. The question at the heart of my work is how is it that by not only exploring how mindfulness can support each of us, right, because that's really important. We all need to be doing the best we can to maximize our resourcefulness, our resourcedness, our ability to stay strong and resilient during this time. But a real question is, as we do that, how, how may we at the same time be deepening our resourcefulness for supporting one another and for deepening our ability to help be a positive part of what wants to be born in the world at this moment, this period in which we know, we don't know exactly what's going on, but we know something important is happening in this moment. We're, we're witnessing and living through multiple intersecting pandemics. So while we are trying to heal through um, and from and bear up against the risk of coronavirus, we're also bearing up against the heightened awareness of the pandemics of social identity-based bias, racism, and other kinds of isms and schisms that separate us. I just want to share the thought that mindfulness, which is often disseminated and offered as a very hyper-individualized personal practice for well-being, can actually be a really important technology, if you will, or support for engagement in the world, for working together with other across lines of real and perceived difference, and for doing the absolute best we can with the moments we have in this relatively short life, however it is long it is on this planet, right? It's gonna, you know, we, we all know that it's the human predicament that we must do the best we can and then pass the baton to the next generation. How do we make the most of this opportunity to transform the world in this moment of radical transformation that we're already in the midst of somehow? Can we be a part of the solution? And so mindfulness in my um, estimation is a way of being a part of the solution. It can help us in the moments where we are feeling disconnected from love, we're feeling rage or enraged because of injustices that we see, we're feeling sadness and grief because Hidden and under, un, under acknowledged grief, I think, is one of the, the traumas of this time that we have yet to even figure out how to deal with. Mindfulness, to me, supports radical emotional agility, being able to sort of be present to acknowledge what we're feeling, really allow ourselves to feel it, but also ask this radical question, what else is here? So even as I'm feeling anger, even as I'm feeling sadness, what else is here? Is there also a sense of warmth, a sense of peace at this moment, a sense of, ha, huh, what is working well within my body and spirit? And so inviting this capacious ability to hold a little bit more of reality and flow in and out of the things that trouble us. That's called equanimity in some of the teachings. Mindfulness can help us, in other words, with, I think, this, this invitation that we're all trying to listen for or open ourselves up to answer, which is all about how do we find ourselves more at home together, more at peace together, more able to work together on this beautiful planet for the healing and liberation of all of us. So I wanna pause and say thank you and invite Gil and Jack into this conversation with me and all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rhonda. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I don't want to leave the campfire, you know. <laughs> I just I just want to stay here and, and uh, absorb everything. 
I get the honor of the first question and it's not even on my list. It just came from hearing you speak. I want to know from you, Rhonda, what was the, the catalyst that, that really uh, changed things for you to bring you to the, to the point where part of the answer is going on inside of you and you needed to focus and we needed to focus on what was going on inside of you? I would say um, that you know that the my 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 evolution as a person who is um both committed to doing what we can with the systems that we have being engaged in the world and certainly law gives us an opportunity and a lot of challenge around how how to be engaged with what's happening around us and and try to work for change with others so i was really aware from my own experience of what a difference law could make in changing and, and creating circumstances of possibility where there had been none before. But what I'd come to see was that there was something missing, that there was something about the conventional ways that we're trained uh, for leadership and, and, um, and for working to resolve conflict using these traditional methods. Something that was leaving out the heart, something that was leaving out a sense of empathy and compassion, one teacher that I saw manifest that more than any of the others I'd had in all of these different, you know, wonderful um, settings for higher education and training and this and that was my grandmother, um, a woman named Nanny Suggs, who had been um, denied the opportunity to get much education at all, born in 1906 in segregated North Carolina, um, whose life had been very difficult as a black woman at that time. But what she had learned was how through her own practices, which for her were basically Christian-based centering prayer, how she could begin every day with a commitment to um, this discipline of her own inner work and how that could be a support for really making the most of whatever opportunities might present for making a positive difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there was a point at when, at, in which I realized I needed some similar modality or you know, method for grounding myself in the possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it wasn't going to come from studying more law books. It wasn't going to come from studying more legal opinions and arguing with people about what we might do. Mm -hmm. But that capacity to stay engaged in those hard questions could be supported by a commitment to personal practice. I'll start out with, a, with a, a phrase that we found in one of your writings from a while ago. It says, we live in the 21st century a radically diverse world, and yet we have never developed the intentional kinds of technologies that address in deep ways what it means to bring people together across cultures. So how do you, talk, how do you, how do you help us in dealing with these issues and trying to reach across these divides to bring people back together? You know, all I can offer is what I have been learning as I've been trying, you know? Learning as I you know, get up each day and accept whatever um, invitation I have on that day to, you know, turn back toward this, these hard questions of how do we um, connect rather than uh, reinforce the patterns and um, trainings and separation and segregation. How do we instead find ways to reinforce that which wants to connect? All I can say is that we all know something if we're willing to pause and reflect about what it means to be included and excluded, disregarded or disrespected because of what we look like. We also know something about how it is that when we've been wounded, one of the ways we respond is pushing people away and defending against being vulnerable again. Mm. So in so many ways, mindfulness can help us, uh, help me, has helped me, like recognize my own woundedness and therefore be a little bit better able to see when somebody else is acting from their own their wounds how do we get this into our school systems at an early age that it's so crucial to future development how do you feel that we can get mindfulness into the school system is that even a possibility yeah you know i mean i'm actually very excited to answer this but just by saying you know stay tuned and look around in your neighborhoods look in your you know local um preschools even head start programs you'd be surprised um how much uh is happening and changing out there because mm -hmm. we're all recognizing that the way we've been doing things hasn't been working so well 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all have noticed. So we're <laughs> noticing that what's been happening in K through 12, what's happening in higher ed, what's happening in law schools, what's happening all around us, whether in law, politics, we need to do this differently. So um, there's an opportunity being created by these crises, as always happens. And more and more, people actually are bringing these practices in. Um, there's a mindful schools program. There's a peace in schools and social justice initiative that's part of the mindful schools program right now. And um, I'm just, just going to name these things and, and encourage you to sort of just be on the lookout because you would be surprised. Um, I, one of my law professor friends pointed out to me when I started bringing mindfulness into um, the law school environment more frequently. After a few years, she came up to me and she said, I have to tell you, I'm starting to, you know, understand the power of this because my little girls in their kindergarten and, and elementary school have been getting some mindfulness training. And so they're coming to me and noticing when I'm getting a little bit tense and they are pausing and they've recently said things like, mom, I think you might need to pause and take a breath. <laughs> you yeah. know? Right. So the kids are starting to learn and we're starting to understand the importance of social and emotional learning. It's funny, my, my four-year-old uh, uh, often tells my two-year-old when she gets upset, uh, pause and count to four, because that's the thing that we have to tell him when he gets upset. So it, it's working, it's spreading, it's spreading like a rainbow. Yeah. Absolutely. Is social bias caused only by persons with social bias? And I think you'll see these questions are kind of tied together. So part two is, how do you distinguish between justice and revenge? So who doesn't have social bias? I mean, are there people? I don't know. It, mm -hmm. How could we, having been born in a world inherently embedded in a social context, is there a way we could have somehow sealed ourselves off from the trainings and embeddedness in our culture? Every, every human being has different kinds of biases. And their biases obviously around social identities tied to those identities that have historically been privileged and subordinated, uh, valued and dis disrespected in our culture. We, pr we sort of don't recognize how much we're up against around the pervasiveness of bi bias at our peril. And there's all kinds of um, resources out there to help us understand how pervasive bias is. There's online surveys, the implicit associations tests. You can go online right now and get a sense for the different biases that might be part of what you're working with, but we all work with them. Um, justice for me, one way of thinking about it, that is, it's what love looks like in public. Mm. So there are these more, you know, technical definitions for just, of justice. But for me, I lean heavily into this idea of it being kind of a version of love in action. Everybody deserves a certain kind of, you know, basic dignity and, and, and security in their person. We all deserve kindness. We all deserve the means to be able to thrive. And so um, to me, justice invites us to figure out how we can work more toward thriving um, that encompasses us all. And so it's not about revenge in any way for me. So I think it's important for us to have these conversations. What do we mean by justice? Mm -hmm. And so the invitation is to heal those separations, recognize that everybody is entitled to love and protection. And that actually does include all of us. And we are all suffering, no matter what our racial background, from the notion that we're somehow superior or inferior. What are some specific ways that you have brought mindfulness into your law practice? Uh, is it only personal or are there ways that you've brought mindfulness into your teaching or interactions with clients or other lawyers? Yeah. So I think of um, another way I think about um, this work and the work of transforming justice is, uh, is to think about it as an ecological project that includes our personal, I've already alluded to this, but I'll lay it out, personal, interpersonal, and systemic efforts. So the question of what can we do personally, individually, what can we do together, and how can we change these systems is always a part of the projects that I'm involved with. So, yes, personal practices of the kind that I've alluded to, including the stop practice, meditation practice, loving kindness practice, daily practices for me, movement practices um, of, of a variety of sort, right, where, sorts where we kind of ground ourselves in the feeling of our being well and connected and belonging on the earth. I bring these practices into classes, into retreats for lawyers and social justice advocates and teachers of mindfulness and leaders and business folks all over the, the world now, 
because we're all in some way, wherever we are, we can do the work of justice. This isn't limited to lawyers and law professors and law students anymore. Is there anything that you would want to, uh, any uh, parting words that you want to leave all of us with? Well, I guess I want to invite us to just take a breath, pause together and feel, again, the unrepeatable nature of this moment and be reminded that that's true for every moment of our lives. And that if we can ask ourselves what else is here in those moments when we're feeling distress and try and turn toward what is well within us and within each other and in this experience of life, from that place, I think we might be able to bear up a little bit better every day against the pressures of this time. And we need each other to be as resilient and strong as possible, but we can do this. Humankind has been in trouble before and struggled before and we've gotten this far. So every one of us can do what we can to make the, the best of this, the, this time. And I thank you all for doing what you can in this moment and joining us here. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Thank you, thank you.